decades, organized criminal networks have seeped into every corner and crevice of the underworld. And in the past year, lockdowns, closures and bans have had little effect in curbing illicit activities. Criminal networks have only taken on a new shape. In South Africa, methamphetamine usage and the networks that support it are at an all-time high. The assassination of a South African police detective highlights the channels by which illegal weapons and firearm licenses are sold to criminals. And new research from the Global Initiative reveals a tight-knit relationship between criminals and corrupt figures in Nairobi's only dump site. You're listening to Africa and the Global Illicit Economy from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. This week, we're in East and Southern Africa. I'm your host, Lindim Tongana. You're on top of the world, but the, in the end, you pay a very heavy price. A flood of a cheap drug called Tick onto the South African market has left drug workers with what they say is their biggest challenge yet. In May last year, two South Africans were arrested at the Kumatiport border with 100 kilograms of crystal methamphetamine. Referred to as Tick, South Africa is one of the largest consumers of meth in East and Southern Africa. But the drug's growing popularity did not happen overnight. As new research from the Global Initiative shows, regional methamphetamine use, production and smuggling has been over 20 years in the making. The level of methamphetamine use really began to take off in around 1996, 1997. This is when it was recognized in Cape Town in particular and, and more widely along the Western Cape province of South Africa as being a substance of increasing use. Jason Eli is a senior expert at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Now, in 1998, so not long after this realization that this new drug was starting to take over the drug-using scene, there was a significant seizure that had occurred where a Chinese ship in March of 1998 was found to be shipping a large amount of ephedrine. The ship was seized and 20 metric tons of ephedrine was found in the ship's hold. Now, ephedrine, of course, has licit uses. It's, it's commonly used in the production of decongestant medications. But the volume that was found in the ship that was originating in China and destined for South Africa certainly indicated that the ephedrine was intended to be used for illicit purposes. This single seizure was two and a half times total amount of global seizures uh, the year prior. This is a good indication that the volume of production in South Africa around 1998 was significantly higher than perhaps was being realized and that it would be fair to say that the industrial production of methamphetamine had well and truly begun. Jason, just how widespread is the use of meth in the region today? Well, South Africa continues uh, to be the largest consumer in the region of Southern and, and Eastern Africa. And by some measures, it's possibly one of the, the largest per capita consumers in the world, which is quite a scary thought. In terms of neighboring countries, you're seeing significant levels of use and growing in places like Botswana, Iswatini, Lesotho, you're seeing emerging markets moving further afield to the point that methamphetamine use is occurring in every country of Eastern and Southern Africa. Why has meth become so popular compared to other drugs such as cocaine and heroin? Well, cocaine and heroin remain certainly popular drugs of use for a variety of reasons. But the attraction of meth is something that I think is contributing to a more embeddedness of meth use across the region. Meth is a substance that is not tied to an agricultural crop. It's not tied to a growing season like, uh, like heroin and cocaine are. Or it can be produced in an industrial production facility that, that can handle production of tons and tons a day. So methamphetamine is, is your universal substance. 
it's perfect for organized criminal groups in that you don't have to rely on seasons and you don't have to rely on crops. Uh, all you have to do is find a way of acquiring the chemicals necessary to make it. And today, the recipes for the production of methamphetamine, although still largely rely on ephedrine and pseudoephedrine, are beginning to be varied as chemists are able to, to use other substances to get to the point of producing high quality methamphetamine. So the ability to limit production of methamphetamine is in many ways more challenging than it is to interrupt the supply chains for heroin. So it's a substance that is easily acquired, can be made anywhere, is easily used, is relatively inexpensive, and is a substance that lets people, particularly those who've been marginalized, disenfranchised, largely kept on the outside of economic development advances over the last 20 to 30 years, it gives them a break from life. They use meth for a few hours in a day. They don't have to deal with the existence in which they find themselves. What has been the single biggest law enforcement oversight in responding to the growing meth trade and consumption in East and Southern Africa? I think there's a, there's a massive underestimation of the volume of meth use in the region. And this, this doesn't go just to regional law enforcement bodies. This is going to global security and law enforcement bodies uh, more generally. And there's a, there's a lack of either understanding or acceptance that there is a significant use of all of these drugs, and in particular methamphetamine, in a large number of countries, uh, particularly in the Southern and Eastern African region. And this use is growing. So I think first recognizing that what we think we know about methamphetamine in particular is not necessarily accurate. The second challenge, particularly in some domestic law enforcement agencies, is the inability to recognize the substance when it's encountered. There are a number of agencies that lack any ability to identify substances when they make an interdiction, when they see something, it's important to know what it is and the inability to test or recognize and differentiate, for example, a white powder from something that is legal and it's leading to exploitation by groups that are continuing to move substances around the region. The final thing I would say, and I think this is the most significant and that's the role that law enforcement agencies in the region are playing in the perpetuation of uh, illicit drug trafficking and drug economies more generally. A lot of the activity that is occurring wouldn't occur but for the assistance and contribution of individuals who are involved in, in law enforcement. Jason, how has politics contributed to the expansion of methamphetamine in the region? As inequality increases, as vulnerability increases, as populations are further marginalized and excluded from the benefits of development, uh, the benefits of socioeconomic prosperity, these are contributory factors to creating environments of deprivation and environments of increasing insecurity. And it's in such environments that individuals are vulnerable to using substances, participating in illicit economies, contributing to the distribution of illicit drugs in particular, and including methamphetamine. In several ways, methamphetamine is, is a consequence of uh, the inability of governments to really deal with issues of equality and inequity that are occurring in their communities and, and something that can't just be addressed. And Jason, what trends do you foresee? I think one of the greatest unknowns right now is, is what's going to happen with respect to COVID-19. We've seen a lot of countries in the region respond by significantly empowering their law enforcement bodies by diverting law enforcement attention towards the maintenance of quarantine, the identification of COVID threats, and the security around government measures as they relate to 
trying to enforce lockdown and other measures to try and come to hand with the pandemic. I think it seems clear right now that access to vaccines by many of the countries in in the region is going to be less available than to a lot of the most developed countries around the world. There seems to be a disproportion of distribution of available vaccines to rich countries and the volume that is being made available, at least at the beginning, to these countries is is largely insignificant. And so not only are we going to see a prolongation of the epi- of of the pandemic in this region and the consequences that this is going to have but we're going to see a much longer period of economic recovery necessary for these countries to regain what has been lost over the year and a half or two years or three years in which they're suffering from uh, from COVID-19. And I think this is going to influence the illicit drug use environment quite enormously. Certainly, if we look at methamphetamine, I think it's reasonable to expect that methamphetamine supply is going to continue to move across the region and penetrate neighboring states. I think it's going to be a drug that will be increasingly consumed in a lot of these communities because certainly uh, levels of poverty are uh, not going to decrease over this period in time and levels of inequity are, are likely to continue to increase, continue to, to be diverted by, uh, by COVID-19 measures. And with the evolution of freer trade in the region as well, you're going to see the ability to move more rapidly these substances around and, and the precursors necessary to produce them become uh, much easier as well. A second evolutionary factor, I think, is the inevitability of methamphetamine to begin to uh, penetrate the region from production points in Southeast Asia. There is a massive amount of methamphetamine being produced in that region. And I think it's inevitable that methamphetamine pills otherwise called yaba, which is a combination of meth and caffeine and is a very common form of meth consumption in Southeast Asia. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see these uh, begin to appear in the region if they're not in the region already and to contribute to increasing demand. Of course, we've seen already the influx of methamphetamine that that is produced in uh, Afghanistan appear in this region in the last year. And I think that demand is only going to continue to increase uh, as we move forward over the next few years. That was Jason Eli, a senior expert at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. A 39-year-old man is appearing in the Bishop Levis Magistrate's Court today in connection with the murder of Lieutenant Colonel Shal Kinia. The 52-year-old top detective attached to the anti-gang unit in Cape Town was shot and killed in front of his home in Bishop Levis last Friday. Uh, convey our condolences and also to urge the South Africa police to do whatever they can and what no stone unturned must be left to get these murderers because the South African Police Services' mandate is to protect and serve. And these men and women, these policemen and women, are the first line of human rights defenders. On Friday, 18 September 2020, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kinnear was assassinated outside of his Bishop Levis home. At the time of his assassination, the colonel had been investigating a guns-to-gangs syndicate involving key underworld figures. According to evidence acquired during the course of the investigation, Police officers were found to be colluding with criminals, providing them with unlawful firearm licenses from South Africa's Central Firearm Registry, or CFR. The number of people every day that are being killed with firearms is in the region of about 23 people a day. I remember very clearly an incident where a child of three years old was shot and killed by somebody who should never have had a license to possess a firearm. Jenny Irish Goboshiane is a researcher at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and the former head of South Africa's Civilian Secretariat for the Police Service. When I was working in the Secretariat of Police, we did an assessment of the Central Firearm Registry where we identified many of the same problems we are identifying now. 
And there was a commitment from the police at the time that they were going to implement a turnaround strategy. Ten years later, going back to doing research on the Central Firearm Registry, we're finding that the situation is as bad, if not worse, than what it was in 2010. And that is an incredibly frustrating situation to be facing. Jenny, how does one legally obtain a firearm in South Africa? South Africa has what is considered some of the best firearm control legislation in the world. There may be some gaps and weaknesses in the Firearm Control Act, but we have the Firearm Control Act, which basically allows for and controls the licensing of firearms and applications for firearms. And there are quite strict measures put in place for anybody who is wanting to access a firearm. So those measures um, contained in the Firearms Control Act include the fact that the person must acquire a competency certificate and be competent in the handling of a firearm. They must be personally competent so they can't be mentally unstable. People with certain criminal records are excluded. They can't have had a charge, for example, of domestic violence against them. They must have facilities to store the firearm. They must have a justifiable reason for wanting to possess the firearm. And then there are only certain levels of firearms that they're allowed to possess. So in theory, we have very comprehensive legislation, which if properly applied, would play a significant role in ensuring that only responsible firearm owners are allowed to possess firearms. Can you explain then how this well-thought-out system is manipulated for criminal purposes? You have the Central Firearms Registry, which is supposed to have developed a number of different IT systems which would enable the proper management and control of firearms. What we have seen is that those IT systems, when the Firearm Control Act was passed in 2000, the South African police were given four years to put in place the necessary IT and other systems in order to be able to manage the implementation of the act. What we're seeing now is we're sitting in in 2021 with the act having been passed in 2000 and the IT systems at the CFR are completely inadequate and problematic and a lot of work is still being done manually, which then opens the system up to major corruption. What is the extent of collusion between criminals and employees of the South African Police Service? We've got more than over a million firearm license holders. And it's very difficult to know exactly how many of those firearm licenses have been fortunately acquired. But if one looks at what has come out in the cases that people like Colonel Kinnear was dealing with, the Stanfield case, the Prince Lou case, etc., We're talking about relatively extensive corruption involving serious organized crime elements. But also in the interviews that we have been conducting with people who are involved in the firearm sector, what has become clear is that a significant number of people are able to buy firearm licenses. Some of them would be criminal elements. Others of them would just be frustrated by the delays in the firearms systems and would be able to purchase firearm. People even gave us costs of how easy it was. So for 2,000 rand, you can get a license within two days. 5,000 rand, you can get a semi-automatic firearm license within a week. Now, given the number of checks that the state is supposed to be implementing before a firearm license is issued, it would be virtually impossible to issue a license in that such a short period of time. So we think that the while we wouldn't have exact stats on exactly how, on the exact nature of how extensive the corruption is, we think it is pretty extensive. Also, you have seen within the Central Firearm Registry a number of people being either disciplined internally or arrested for corruption, and then they seem to just be replaced by people who continue with the corruption. If corruption within the CFR continues at its present level, what are the implications for South Africa's battle with crime? It really undermines the attempts at all levels to deal with violent crime. And I think that because even though a lot of the firearms where violent crimes are committed would be illegal firearms, when you have top gang leaders being able to access licensed firearms, which they can use not only to intimidate people, 
but also to access ammunition which they can supply to their foot soldiers, it becomes a very frightening situation. I think that at some point there needs to be a very serious political intervention in terms of forcing the police to deal with the Central Firearms Registry. You've had Parliament try to deal with it. You've had the Civilian Secretary for Police try to deal with it. You've had groups like Gun Free and even some of the more responsible firearm ownership groups trying to deal with the situation. And I think that the police really need to be put on terms now in terms of dealing with firearm registry. I think that what is also concerning for me is that at the moment, the police are involved in looking at amendments to Firearm Control Act. Many of those amendments are quite important and will enhance the Firearms Control Act as it stands. But if the police are unable to implement the existing Firearms Control Act, then it worries me about how effective will those amendments be. Have any arrests been made as a result of investigations Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kinnear was pursuing at the time of his death? There are more than 23 people who have been arrested. Those people include senior police officials up to the level of brigadiers, as well as certain key figures in the underworld within Cape Town. So we've even got two station commissioners who have been at the brigadier level who've been arrested for their involvement in in the fraudulent issuing of firearm licenses. And Jenny, what are your recommendations for what needs to be done to fix the present situation? I think the first key recommendation is that the police need to acknowledge that in the last 10 years, they've been unable to develop an effective turnaround strategy and that they need some sort of assistance in developing that turnaround strategy. Then I think there has to be very serious accountability for the implementation of the strategy, where they are able to provide accurate reports on that. I think there also needs to be some sort of oversight of the police's turnaround strategy in terms of the central firearm registry. So it's not only assistance in developing the strategy, but then some sort of external oversight of the police's implementation of that strategy. And then I think one of the things that has concerned me in this research is that we found both amongst the pro and anti-gun lobby groups that there is a very serious concern amongst those groupings about the way in which the central firearms registry. So even some of your gun associations, etc., some of the more responsible associations also have very deep concerns about this. And if we're going to regulate the firearms effectively, then we need to be able to engage with people who have an interest in seeing that those firearms registry was, and that includes both some of the more responsible pro-gun lobby groups and some of the anti-gun lobby groups such as gun groups. And the police need to start an engagement process around them. That was Jenny Irish Koboshiane, a researcher at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. Nairobi's Dandora dump site is the only one designated for the city of over 4 million people. Located in the northeast suburbs of the city, the dump spans 30 acres of land and is filled with thousands of tons of waste produced daily. Mismanagement and corruption have made the dump site insecure and violent. The Nairobi City Council collects a portion of the city's waste. The rest is outsourced to ministries, state companies and private collectors who often charge residents an additional fee for trash collection. But Dandora is not just a place for Nairobi's trash. It sits in the middle of an informal settlement that is home to thousands. A lot of trash has been spewed by the roadside. There's not been a lot of collection going on. That is besides the fact that we have two centers of power in Nairobi, like Nairobi Metropolitan Services and the county government. But as we speak right now, the dam site is a very big menace because it is uh, wearing down infrastructure, It is impeding movement because some of the trash have completely blocked some roads. Brian Alaman James Omondi is the administrator of the Dandora Community Justice Centre and head of their Life and Dignity campaign. James, can you describe what the Dandora dump site is like for those who live in the community? If you are to go there today yourself, you will find it very disgusting and filthy and, you know, But for the people who are used to working there, I think they've developed a thick skin. But you will be surprised at how 
people are working there just move around with ease and uh, they have adapted to that place they like they now call it home you find people who come here for the very first time in dandora especially they develop complications like they start coughing you know after a while they, they're coughing and you know they're asking how do you survive but for for us who have been here <laughs> You know, I think the, this is the way the body adapts to some situation. And so you're even surprised that people are actually been here all this while and they're actually surviving. The Dandora dumping site, and a few weeks ago, this was a fighting ground for two particular groups. One group, we are told, wanted to take over this dumping site and make it their cash cow, while the other group wanted to bring sanity to this place. Residents living in close proximity to the dump site are not only vulnerable to health risks. Over the years, violence in and around the dump site has gotten so out of hand that police find it hard to control. Now there's a stretch along that dump site that is very dangerous even during the day. You know, along that stretch, because some people have to connect from the border to other places to do that stretch. And sometimes you find they are mugged, they are robbed. Perpetrators disappear inside that mountain of garbage. With the current situation of the COVID-19 pandemic and all this, a lot of youth find themselves idle and they know they need to survive. So they actually try and find ways of surviving. The dump site will provide a perfect haven for escaping and even planning their motives and their activities. So I will say partly it is, and you know, once someone commits a crime and actually disappears into that garbage, it's very hard even for the police to get inside. Criminal groups are involved at different parts of the waste removal process, from purposefully misweighing amounts of garbage to illegal fees charged for entry to the dump site itself. According to James, conflict between gangs and the community ebbs and flows. There are times when it is relatively calm, there are no cases of mugging or stealing or anything. Yeah. Then there are times that uh, the trend tilts and now there is an upside of criminal activities. So sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, because most of them are known around where they are working within that particular community. Sometimes, even if they are causing harm to the Dandora residents, they will not do it there per se, but they will go do it someplace else where they are clean. They are not known that much. So they, it actually just depends on the seasons. You know, There are times when they are completely absorbed in their work that they do not even have time to think of other things. But sometimes... When the workload is not that much now, they get they have a lot of time on their hands to think about doing other things. Plans are ongoing to convert part of this dam site into a recreational facility and a material recovery center in an ambitious five-year solid management plan. For this to happen, the trash will have to be moved to an even bigger location in Rwai. There will be no leaching of waste. The drainage system will be very good. We shall have a recycling. In 2014, the area's former Member of Parliament argued for the Dandora dump site's relocation. Though an audit of the dump site was conducted, vested interests prevented it. The Dandora dump site's current condition can be attributed to rapid economic growth and the withdrawal of public services during the 1990s. But James believes that in order for the dump site to shift from being a blight for many and a benefit for few, a major transformation must be undertaken. The whole of Nairobi brings their waste here. But what are the people of Andorra benefiting from it? Posting all that filth from across Nairobi. Nothing. It's only a few individuals that are benefiting from it, that are gaining, you know, and, and, and earning and make profits from it. The waste, waste management business. So I think the first thing that the government should do is to secure that area, start a recycling plant so that, you know, the garbage becomes something that people will value so much. People will not need to dump their, their garbage outside, besides the road, their trash. They will actually be looking forward to taking the trash to the dump site so because they will know they will also be able to earn. So the garbage will become some sort of economic activity and just being able to dispose your waste and having it recycled. That was Brian James Omondi, the administrator of the Dandora Justice Centre and head of the Life and Dignity campaign. Shifts in power coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic are giving way to new developments in East and Southern Africa's illicit economy. South Africa's methamphetamine industry has been years in the making, but diverted resources due to post-COVID recovery efforts 
are making it even harder to abate. The murder of Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kinnear and its ensuing investigation reveals the systemic problems of corruption, the inadequacies of the Central Firearm Registry, and gang violence in South Africa. And criminal enterprises emerging from Nairobi's Dandora dump site are threatening the lives and livelihoods of the city's populace. But the dump's neighboring communities are determined to call profiters to task. That concludes this episode of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy with the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Thank you to our guests, Jason Eli, Jenny Irish Koboshiani, and Brian James Omondi. For more on this episode, visit globalinitiative.net and take a look at the Civil Society Observatory of Illicit Economies in East and Southern Africa, Risk Bulletin Number 15, as well as Gun Licenses for Sale, South Africa's Failing Firearms Control. Also keep an eye out for Jason Eli's upcoming report, A Synthetic Age, the evolution of methamphetamine markets in East and Southern Africa. The report provides a rare and detailed analysis of meth availability, prices, distribution systems, and domestic marketplaces across the region. On our website, you can also listen to previous episodes of Africa and the Global Illicit Economy, as well as other podcasts from the Global Initiative. You'll hear from us again in two weeks. Until then, this podcast was produced by Alexandra Sahai-Williams. I'm your host, Lindim Tongana. Thanks for listening.